Um, so what, what I'm going to present today represents very much my, my own interpretation of these results. I know some people in the audience, like Andrew Oxenham, may, may dispute some of what I say or dispute some of my conclusions. But anyway, this, this is my take on the, the story. So I want to start by uh, just introducing what I mean by uh, temporal fine structure and envelope. This is a, a slide I showed previously, uh, this, this introductory part, that some of the people here were not here for my earlier lecture, so I'll briefly go over it again. We've already heard many times that each place on the basilar membrane behaves like a band pass filter. And so the response at each place can be considered as composed of a, a temporal fine structure and an envelope. You can think of the temporal <laughs> fine structure as a kind of carrier, and the properties of the temporal fine structure are represented in the fine details of the timing of nerve impulses. The nerve impulses tend to be phase-locked to the individual <coughs> cycles of that carrier. Um, whereas the envelope is the slower fluctuations in overall amplitude over time, and that's represented in the auditory nerve in, in two ways. You, you get fluctuations in firing rate over time, so uh, the fluctuation, the firing rate is higher at a peak in the envelope than at a dip. Um, but for fairly high envelope rates, you can also get direct phase locking to the envelope, so you get uh, a, a one spike for each peak in the envelope, for example. Uh, and we know that phase locking weakens at high frequencies, uh, and that temporal fine structure is going to be weak or absent above some number. The exact upper limit is not yet clear in humans, uh, and estimates range from 1,500 hertz up to about 8,000 hertz, depending on which experiment you believe and, and who you believe. Um, so this illustrates the, the basic idea. I'm starting with a broadband signal, uh, and any broadband signal is filtered in the cochlea, uh, uh, into a series of narrow band signals, and here I'm showing the signals, a simulation of what you might see on the basilar membrane for three center frequencies, 370, 1500, and 4800. I've given here the normal bandwidth of the auditory filter <coughs> at those center frequencies, uh, and you can see that uh, the, both the carrier and the envelope rates are lower at low frequencies. So here we have slow fluctuations in the carrier um, and nerve spikes would tend to occur at peaks here and here and here in the temporal fine structure. Uh, and at a high center frequency, the carrier frequency is higher, but also the rate of envelope fluctuations on average is higher. And here I've superimposed the envelope, uh, which is these slower fluctuations. Uh, and it's often argued that these slow fluctuations are the most important feature for intelligibility. And that, that goes back uh, especially to the work of Bob Shannon, showing that temporal envelope information in just a few noise bands centered at different frequencies is sufficient to understand speech in quiet. Uh, but I would like to argue that the temporal fine structure is also important, especially for more difficult listening situations where background sounds are present. Uh, so I want to go on now to talk a bit about the, the pitch of complex tones uh, and the role of temporal fine structure in the perception of the pitch of complex tones. Uh, now, the pitch of complex tones may be derived from information about the frequencies of lower resolved harmonics. Harmonics below about the eighth are what we call resolved. They can be heard out to some extent as individual harmonics. Uh, and this was known as long ago, ago as uh, Helmholtz talked about hearing out individual harmonics in complex sounds, um, and this was formally investigated by Plump and many others since then. Uh, and in principle, information about the frequencies of those lower harmonics could be represented by place cues, by a local peak in the excitation pattern, 
or could they, the frequencies of the individual harmonics could be represented by a temporal fi fine structure, that is, phase locking to the individual harmonics. Uh, and my view is that uh, it's this temporal fine structure information that's dominant for frequencies below 5,000 hertz. Uh, if, if you, one piece of evidence for this, which I won't go into in detail, is that if you create inharmonic tones where the components are roughly equally spaced on the herb number scale, then we can hear out those individual components when they're separated by about 1.25 or 1.5 cams on the herb number scale. And that holds for low and medium frequencies, but if you go to much higher frequencies, say 6 kilohertz or 8 kilohertz, <coughs> people have a huge amount of difficulty in hearing out individual harmonics, and even when they're separated by three cams on the herb number scale, they have a lot of trouble doing it. So something is changing in our ability to hear out harmonics at very high frequencies, and that, <coughs> that may be well re related to the loss of temporal fine structure information. Now for higher harmonics uh, in a complex harmonic complex tone, the harmonics interfere uh, on the basilar membrane and this happens for harmonics above about the eighth. Um, and then information might be extracted in two ways. We may extract temporal fine structure information from those interfering harmonics but we may also extract envelope information. And I, I want to focus particularly on which of these two may actually be occurring. One way we can test the role of temporal fine structure for unresolved harmonics is to use so-called frequency shifted or inharmonic tones. And these are created from harmonic tones by shifting each component upwards by the same amount in hertz. So that's illustrated here. I've got three high harmonics of a 200 hertz fundamental, uh, 1800 hertz, 2000 and 2200. Those are shown by the black lines. And an inharmonic tone is created by shifting each component upwards in frequency by the same amount. And this does not change the envelope repetition rate. In this example, the envelope repeats 200 times per second for both the harmonic and the inharmonic tones, but that frequency shift slightly changes the pattern of the temporal fine structure. <laughs> and that's illustrated here. These are the waveforms of the tones that I just illustrated. Um, and this is the harmonic tone shown at the top and we imagine that nerve spikes would occur at these prominent peaks in the temporal fine structure labeled 1, 2 and 3 here and 1, 2 and 3 here. And it's been argued that the pitch that we hear corresponds to the most prominent interval between these biggest peaks in the temporal fine structure. So the interval from 1 to 1 dash or 2 to 2 dash or 3 to 3 dash. Of course, there's some ambiguity. Many time intervals are present, but the one that occurs most prominently uh, determines the pitch that we hear, and that corresponds to this interval 1 to 1 dash or 2 to 2 dash. When you look at the inharmonic tone, the frequency shifted tone, it, at first it looks very similar, and as I said, the envelope repetition rate is exactly the same, but the timing of the peaks in the temporal fine structure shifts slightly and you can see that by looking at these tick marks along the axis. Here there's a peak at 2 dash exactly centered on that tick mark on the axis and there's a peak here centered at that tick mark but here the position of that peak shifts slightly. So this interval 1 to 1 dash or 2 to 2 dash is slightly shorter for this inharmonic sound than for the harmonic sound. So if we're uh, sensitive to the time interval between peaks in the temporal fine structure, then we should hear a slight difference in pitch between this sound and this sound. Well, this 
basic idea is around the long time. It was first, <coughs> first described by Shouten uh, in 1940 <laughs> and later on was uh, explored by De Boer in his thesis work. And they showed that indeed with these types of stimuli, when you shift all the components upwards a little bit, people hear a shift in pitch. Um, and, they, and when the harmonics were relatively high and unresolved, this was attributed to a sensitivity to temporal fine structure. Now there's a, a problem with the experiment as I just described it, in that if you take a bunch of harmonic components and shift them up, now, the whole pattern of excitation shifts a little bit along the basal membrane. You get a shift to the right. So it's possible that subjects are influenced by this shift in the excitation pattern, and that's partly responsible for the pitch shift that they hear. And so to control for that, um, I looked around for a PhD student with the same name as me, so we could publish under more and more. Um, and uh, we did an experiment where we created complex tones with many components uh, and we passed them through a fixed bandpass filter centered on the higher harmonics. And the idea is then that as you shift the harmonics around, um, you get a similar shaped excitation pattern. You're kind of holding the center of gravity of the sound constant. And we added a broadband background noise to mask components on the edges of the pass band and to mask combination tones. Um, so these are, this is an example of the spectra of uh, a harmonic sound in black here and a, an inharmonic frequency shifted sound here. Uh, the spectral envelope is exactly the same, um, but there's a, a, a slight shift in the <coughs> positioning of the harmonics for the frequency shifted one. Um, and these are, this is an example of calculated excitation patterns for these sounds. Um, uh, and this, this is for the largest possible frequency shift, which is half the fundamental frequency. That's when the harmonic and frequency shifted sounds are most different. Uh, and this was when the bandpass filter was centered on the 11th harmonic. So there's two excitation patterns here, one in black for the harmonic sound and one in red with a dashed line for the inharmonic sound. And the, you can see that they're very, very similar to one another. And down here, the excitation pattern is dominated by the background noise that we added. Uh, this shows um, some simulations of what these sounds look like on the basilar membrane. Uh, we like, when we use these harmonic and inharmonic tones, we like to add the components with random component phases. And that has the result that the shape of the envelope varies randomly from one stimulus to the next, to the next. So I'm showing here an example of two harmonic tones, both with a fundamental frequency of 100 hertz. Uh, and I'm looking here at the output of a simulated auditory filter centered at 1,000 hertz. And you can see that these tones have different <coughs> envelope shapes. Um, so, uh, and in fact, these are harmonic tones and they also have different envelope shapes. So the envelope shape does not provide a cue for discriminating the harmonic and inharmonic tones because that's randomly varying for every stimulus. Um, but I've illustrated here the time intervals between uh, prominent peaks in the temporal fine structure close to adjacent envelope maxima. And for these harmonic sounds, um, the intervals are 10 milliseconds, 9, 10, and 11. So 10 occurs more often uh, than any other interval, and people tend to hear a pitch corresponding to the missing fundamental. Uh, and here's an example, let's look at this one, a frequency shift of 25 hertz, um, and now the intervals in the temporal fine structure have shifted uh, 9.75, 8.75, 9.75, and 10.75, and the most prominent one is 9.75, so we predict a slight upward pitch shift. And that's usually what is heard 
although sometimes people report hearing other pitches, for these sounds with only a small number of high components, the pitch is often ambiguous, but when people report another pitch, it usually corresponds to one of these <laughs> possible time intervals. Okay, um, so what we found when we used these types of stimuli is that if the tones had some, at least one harmonic below the 14th, people heard a shift in pitch. Uh, and so we interpreted that as indicating a sensitivity to temporal fine structure. So when the lowest harmonic is, the, is in the range about 9 to 14, we think that subjects are using this temporal fine structure information uh, to uh, extract the pitch. But if you have all harmonics above the 14th, people will no longer hear any difference in pitch between the harmonic and inharmonic sounds. And we think that indicates a sensitivity only to the envelope. And the pitch that you get in that case is rather weak. So the ability to hear differences in envelope rate is not very good. And so the pitch is rather <coughs> weak when you only have envelope information. Whereas in this transition region where you have harmonics in the range 8 to 14, um, sensitivity to changes in pitch is still quite good. So we, we adapted a version of this uh, test um, to, uh, to really for use it in testing clinical populations like hearing impaired people or older people. Uh, and we call this the TFS1 <coughs> test. Uh, and it's very similar to what I just described. Uh, the task is, here is to discriminate harmonic and inharmonic tones. And as I just described, we start with many harmonics and pass them through a fixed bandpass filter centered on the high harmonics to minimize excitation pattern cues. We add the components in random phase so the envelope is not a useful cue for discrimination and we add a background noise to mask combination tones, distortion products, and to mask components on the edges of the passband. Uh, and we use a two interval false choice method, but in each interval there are four 200 millisecond tone bursts with 100 milliseconds between them, and there's 300 millisecond silence between the two intervals. So in one interval you hear four harmonic tones, all <coughs> identical except for the random component phases, so the randomly changing envelope, but they all have the same pitch, so you hear ah, 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 ah. you hear something like that. And in the other interval, the sound alternates between harmonic and inharmonic, and if you're sensitive to the difference between those, you hear ah, 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 and you pick the interval where you hear something changing. And one advantage of this method is that all you have to do is detect the interval where something is changing. And subjects don't have to name the direction of a pitch change, which is difficult often for naive subjects, especially people who aren't musically trained. And it also <coughs> overcomes the problem that these stimuli have ambiguous pitches. So sometimes you frequency shift the inharmonic up, one upwards, but people hear a downward shift in pitch. But in this task, all they've got to say is, is there a difference in pitch? Uh, and that's easy to do. And we vary the frequency, frequency shift adaptively to determine a threshold. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, the, the biggest difference between the H and the I tones occurs when the frequency shift, delta F, is one half of the fundamental frequency, F0. Uh, and if a subject is doing badly in the task, then they'll, they'll, if they make a number of wrong responses and, and yet the adaptive procedure is calling for a frequency shift more than half the fundamental frequency, then we automatically switch to measuring the percent correct with delta F fixed at 0.5 times the fundamental frequency. Um, uh, now, here are some results for normal hearing subjects. Now, interestingly, there are quite big variations in performance between normal hearing subjects, um, but they can all do it. Um, so here I'm showing results for a fundamental frequency of 200 hertz, um, uh, 
plotted as a function of sound level. And what I'm plotting here is the relative shift at threshold, that is the shift in frequency of the components divided by the fundamental frequency. So this is our kind of limit. If they hit that limit, then they can't do the task. You can see that performance is not affected much by the level relative to the absolute threshold, which is a, a good feature because it means that when you're testing hearing impaired subjects, you don't have to worry about the fact that they might be listening at a lower sensation level than the normal hearing subjects that you test. Um, uh, and this is just showing the effect of fundamental frequency. Uh, so one subject, one normal hearing subject could not do it when the fundamental frequency was 400 hertz. And you'll recall then that if we've got a, a filter centered at 11 times the fundamental frequency, we're getting up into the frequency range where phase locking is very weak. Um, and also, some subjects can't do it when you have a very low fundamental frequency. And that may reflect difficulty of the auditory system of measuring accurately very long time intervals between nerve spikes. And th this is a question that <coughs> other people have looked at, but there's, there's evidence that the auditory system is not very good at measuring very long intervals between nerve spikes. Um, but for these mid-range fundamental frequencies from 100 up to 300 hertz, all normal hearing subjects could do the task with the filter centered at the 11th harmonic. Um, so we think that this test provides a simple, quick and robust way to measure sensitivity to TFS of complex tones. Uh, over, when the components fall in this mid-frequency range from about 1100 to 4400 hertz, we found that learning effects are small, so you don't have to give subjects a lot of practice before they take the test. Uh, and the outcome of the test is relatively unaffected by the test level. Uh, and you can run it on any PC with a good quality sound card. Now, we've applied this TFS test using hearing impaired subjects in a number of studies. And these, these are people with cochlear hearing loss. And we find that generally they perform more poorly than normal, even if they only have a very mild hearing loss like 30 decibels, they often perform really badly on this test. Um, and so we think that um, hearing impairment is adversely affecting the ability to use temporal fine structure. Now some people have argued that um, this could be due to other things like reduced frequency selectivity and that's something that we, we can maybe come back to in the question time. Um, but this, this test is certainly very sensitive to um, even mild hearing loss. Um, and we find that some hearing impaired listeners just can't perform the task at all. Um, even, and we've even found some subjects who can't perform the task even though their auditory filter bandwidths are normal at the centre frequency corresponding to the frequency components. Uh, so something is going wrong in hearing impaired people that stops them being able to perform this task. And, and in fact, the hearing impaired listeners get quite frustrated when you try to get them to do this task because they're sitting in the booth and they can't hear any difference. And they say, why are you getting me to do this task? <laughs> There's no difference between these sounds. And they get, they get really annoyed. I want to move on to talk a bit about the effects of age. Um, and I want to briefly describe a study conducted by Christian Fulgraber, myself, and, and Michael Stone. And we compared two groups of subjects with matched audiograms. So we had young normal hearing subjects and older normal hearing subjects. Uh, and I want to say so something here. These were really matched. This, we didn't pick subjects who were nearly normal. <laughs> the older subjects, on average, had the same audiogram as the younger subjects, at least up to 6 kilohertz. We couldn't quite get a match at 8 kilohertz. But all the stimuli we used in the study were low-pass filtered at 6 kilohertz. So over the frequency range of the stimulus, of the stimuli, they were really matched. Um, 
And in order to get enough older subjects with normal audiograms, Christian Fulgrower screened several hundred older people who thought they had normal hearing. We advertised for people with normal hearing, and they all came and said, yeah, oh, my hearing is great. And when we tell you that it wasn't, <laughs> Most, the great majority had a hearing loss. So these are really well matched. Um, and we use the TFS test <laughs> and, and another test that measures sensitivity to intraoral phase differences that we call the TFS-LF test, which I, I won't describe in detail, but it's similar to the TFS-1 test in structure, but, invo but it involves detecting a shift in intraoral phase across the two ears. Um, and what we found was that despite the matched audiograms, performance on both of these tests was poorer for the older group <coughs> than for the young group. Uh, and this just shows the, the mean results. Here, we, to, to make everything comparable, we've converted all scores to a, a measure of sensitivity. So higher scores mean better performance, but you don't need to worry about the details of this. But these are results of the TFS1 test, and these are results of the binaural test, the TFS-LF test. And you can see that the older listeners perform uh, more poorly, sorry, the older listeners here have lower D prime scores, they have worse performance than the young subjects uh, on both of these tests. Uh, and I should say that these groups were, were matched uh, for their, their cognitive abilities um, as measured with an IQ test. Um, okay, so age also <laughs> adversely affects the ability to use temporal fine structure. Uh, uh, and uh, there are many studies that have looked at <coughs> binaural sensitivity to TFS and have shown a worsening with increasing age. Um, and interestingly, for binaural sensitivity, it appears that age actually has a bigger effect than hearing loss. There are also studies looking at the effect of hearing loss on binaural sensitivity. and. While hearing loss does have an effect, uh, uh, the effect of age appears to be even bigger. Uh, and Christian and I have just uh, published a meta-analysis combining results from lots of studies published in Trends in Hearing, showing quite substantial effects of age, but only moderate effects of hearing loss on binaural sensitivity, uh, of course, all at low frequencies. I want to talk a bit about the role of temporal fine structure in speech perception. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, it's commonly believed that envelope fluctuations are the most important cues for speech intelligibility. But I, I would like to argue that when background sounds are present, temporal fine structure may play an important role. And of course, cochlear implants convey mainly envelope cues, as we heard in some earlier talks, um, and it's well known that people with cochlear implants have severe <coughs> problems understanding speech in noise. Now, undoubtedly, some of those problems come from the current spread and, and effectively poor frequency selectivity that you get in cochlear implants, but part of that difficulty might also come from the inability to use temporal fine structure for people with cochlear implants. Um, and we know that the intelligibility of speech in the presence of background sounds is greatly reduced when signals are vocoded, uh, passed through a vocoder which disrupts temporal <laughs> fine structure cues, uh, uh, but preserves envelope cues to some extent. So uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about studies using vocoders, so many of you be, will be familiar with this, but just for those who aren't, this shows the general structure of a vocoder. Uh, you filter the signal into a number of frequency channels, so you have several bandpass filters with different center frequencies. Um, you extract the envelope in each channel. A simple way of doing that is by rectifying and low-pass filtering, but it can also be done uh, using the Hilbert transform to get the so-called Hilbert envelope. Then you use that envelope signal to modulate either a tone at the center frequency of the channel or a band of noise. 
Usually you filter again uh, with the same filter as you use for analysis. Uh, you may have some kind of filter in to restore, restore the general spectral shape of the signal. Uh, and then you add all the ch channel signals together. So this is done for each channel and you add all the signals together. So that gives you a vocoded signal. Uh, and I want to describe a study done by Catherine Hopkins uh, uh, in my lab um, where we, we filtered the speech sounds into 32 channels, each of which had a width of one erb n, the, the normal bandwidth of the auditory filters. Uh, and we did not apply any processing in some channels. So bands up to the nth were added back together without further processing. So we had intact speech preserving the temporal fine structure uh, in some channels, channels are up or bands up to the nth. Uh, and we compensated for time delays produced by the filtering to re-align, temporally align the different channels. But bands from n plus 1 to 32 were noise vocoded uh, and that strongly disrupts the representation of the temporal fine structure but uh, preserves envelope cues reasonably well. And we vary the value of n from 0 up to 32. So when n is 32 we've got fully intact speech with both envelope and temporal fine structure cues intact and when n is 0 this means that all bands were noise vocoded and we've strongly disrupted the temporal fine structure but preserved the envelope to some extent. And we can have a transition between those by varying the value of n. And we measured speech reception thresholds uh, for <coughs> detect, uh, identifying the speech of a target talker using sentences in the presence of a single background talker. Uh, and we tested two groups of subjects, normal hearing subjects and hearing impaired subjects who were selected to have moderate flat cochlear hearing losses or sensory neural hearing losses. And for the subjects with hearing loss, uh, we applied uh, amplification, frequency dependent amplification, uh, to compensate for their hearing loss using something that we call the Cambridge formula. You can think of this as, as like the NL, NAL formula for amplification, but just, just our own flavor of it, if you like. But it, it ensures that the speech is audible in each frequency channel while maintaining a comfortable loudness. And this shows the results. Um, so uh, we're, we're plotting the speech reception threshold as the signal to noise ratio required for 50% correct uh, as a function of the number of channels um, with it intact temporal fine structure. Uh, so over on the right here, we've got the fully intact speech with all, all channels, including both envelope and temporal fine structure. Over on the left here is the fully vocoded signal, and we, we've got this transition in between where we're adding channels with intact temporal fine structure. And you can see these are the results for the normal hearing subjects. They start off better than the hearing impaired subjects shown here. They've got lower speech reception thresholds. But as you add channels with intact temporal fine structure, they get better and better. Uh, and, and there's a large improvement as you add channels with intact temporal fine structure. In contrast, the hearing impaired subjects start off performing more poorly and they get very little benefit from adding the channels with intact temporal fine structure. Uh, now you can see here the error bars are quite large. Some hearing impaired subjects did get a, a reasonably large benefit in adding temporal fine structure and other subjects really got no benefit at all. So for some subjects their performance was the same with intact speech and vocoded speech. It was as if those subjects were only sensitive to envelope cues and weren't using temporal fine structure at all. Um, so just to summarize those findings, as the value of n increased, the speech reception threshold decreased, I improved, and the improvement was about 15 dB for the normal hearing subjects, but only on average 5 dB 
for the hearing impaired subjects. So the hearing impaired subjects got only a small advantage from the intact temporal fine structure. Uh, and when we had the intact signal, the original TFS present in all channels, the SRT was about minus 17 dB for the normal <coughs> hearing subjects and plus 2 dB. So there's a huge difference between them there uh, with this particular selection of uh, target and masker. But a few hearing impaired subjects showed near normal benefit from adding the original TFS and some showed no benefit. And we got a similar pattern of findings using a tone vocoder, but I'll, I won't show those results here. Okay, um, I want to talk now a bit about the relevance of temporal fine structure information in different frequency regions, again in a situation where you have a target talker in the presence of a background talker. Now, temporal fine structure may be important for coding the fundamental frequency of each talker, uh, and we know that fundamental frequency estimation is best when low resolved harmonics are present, and this might depend mainly on temporal fine structure at low frequencies. So it might be that it's mainly the low frequency temporal fine structure that it's important. But, Temporal fine structure may also be important for coding the frequencies of formants. Uh, and I've cited here a classic study of Young and Sachs, who showed that in terms of their representation in the auditory nerve, the spectra of vowels were not well represented at high sound levels because of neural saturation effects, but a representation in terms of the temporal fine structure, in terms of phase locking to the formant frequencies, was robust over a wide frequency range and a wide range of sound levels. So temporal fine structure in principle could be important over a wide frequency range. So in this study, um, the task was again to identify the speech of a target talker in the presence of a background talker, and we measured the speech reception threshold but we stimulated the, we split the stimuli into five frequency regions. And in four of those five regions, the stimuli were tone vocoded using channels that were one herb wide. So these channels conveyed mainly envelope information. The temporal fine structure was disrupted. And the remaining region was either absent, we kind of filtered out that spectral region, there was a, a spectral gap or hole in the stimulus, or that region was unprocessed and had both the original temporal fine structure and the original envelope information. And we included conditions where all regions were vocoded and all regions were unprocessed. Uh, and our argument was that the benefit from envelope information in a specific frequency region could be determined as the difference between the conditions with all regions vocoded and one region missing. So with all regions vocoded you've mainly got envelope information in different frequency regions and if you filter out one region and measure the change that you get that's measuring the importance of the envelope information in that frequency region. And the benefit from having the original temporal fine structure in addition to the envelope information in a specific region, frequency region can be calculated as the difference between the condition with all regions vocoded and with one region intact. So in, in one region we add back the original signal with both envelope and temporal fine structure and the benefit that we get from that gives us a measure of the contribution of temporal fine structure. And this shows the results for normal hearing subjects. So here I'm, I'm just showing benefit scores from the envelope only or the envelope plus the temporal fine structure as a function of the spectral region. The center frequency of the spectral region is shown at the top. Uh, and, and you can see that generally the benefit scores are greater for the lower spectral regions than for the high spectral regions. Uh, but there's some benefit from envelope plus temporal fine structure even at these higher frequencies, but it's, it's somewhat less benefit than at the lower center frequencies. And if we look at the results for the hearing impaired subjects, 
Now, basically, they, they show a benefit from envelope queues, and then when you add the temporal fine structure, there's really not much extra benefit um, compared to the envelope queues alone. So again, the hearing impaired subjects are, are not showing a large change uh, when you go, when you add the temporal fine structure uh, to the envelope information. But again, there were large individual differences, and I'm sorry, this, this slide has a lot of information in it, but this is just showing the results for the individual hearing impaired subjects. And some of these subjects did show uh, consistent benefits of adding the temporal fine structure. For example, this subject here is consistently doing better for temporal fine structure plus envelope than for temporal fine structure alone, um, whereas some other subjects perform nearly identically for the envelope alone and the envelope plus the temporal fine structure. Um, and we found in this experiment, we, in this experiment, we also tested subjects on this TFS1 task that I mentioned earlier. And here I'm showing average scores for two frequency regions. Here I'm showing benefit scores uh, from temporal fine structure, again, averaged over uh, frequency regions. So here this is just the difference between all regions vocoded and all regions unprocessed. So that's a measure of the benefit from TFS. And for the hearing impaired subjects only, there's a, a significant correlation between those scores. So <coughs> the benefit from TFS in the speech task is correlated with the benefit that we measure using this psychoacoustic task, which is reassuring, I think. So, um, and just in the last few minutes, I want to show results of speech intelligibility measures uh, obtained in this study of Fulgrave, Moore, and Stone that I talked about earlier on. Um, so we're plotting a TFS sensitivity horizontally, um, and uh, we're plotting the speech identification scores vertically. Here, higher numbers indicate better performance, um, and Scores for consonants are shown at the top, scores for sentences are shown <coughs> at the bottom. And, and generally, the older subjects, shown by the filled symbols, had poorer speech performance than the young subjects, so the black circles are generally falling below the open circles. And there's a correlation between the scores on these TFS tasks and speech intelligibility, especially for the consonants here. So um, TFS sensitivity uh, is correlated with uh, speech performance. There's also a correlation with temporal envelope sensitivity, which I haven't talked about, but it's a lower correlation than the correlation with sensitivity to temporal fine structure. Um, so just some conclusions. I've argued that temporal fine structure is important for pitch perception and for speech perception, especially for listening in the presence of background sounds. And people with cochlear hearing loss and older people have a reduced or sometimes no ability to use temporal fine structure. Uh, and temporal fine structure is not conveyed effectively by current cochlear implants. And this may account partly, not entirely, but partly for their poor pitch, pitch perception and poor speech perception when background sounds are present. And I think my time is nearly out, so I better just skip to the end. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening.